So it's a pleasure to kick off this symposium for the third time. Um, my name is Sumaya. I am a senior group leader at the Broad Institute um, and running bioinformatics and machine learning group. I have a couple of thank you to give before we can start. Thanks to the organizing committee, the entire committee is here, I hope. Um, it takes a village to organize a symposium, invite everyone, and a lot of time and effort is invested into it. So thanks to everyone. Especially this year, we started our pre-symposium workshop, and I received very good feedback that it went extremely well, and it was an engaging workshop. Uh, then our advisors, they helped us through the speaker selection and throughout the um, year. So thanks to all our advisors. Um, then our generous sponsors. Thank you all. <laughs> um, next uh, comes our line of speakers. As you can see, uh, they are um, the stellar scientists in academia and industry. And uh, we are very thankful for traveling all the way and attending this symposium. And then our lightning talk winners. So this is kind of um, the spotlight of the show that we invite one minute, uh, five minutes talk, one slides. And I'm looking forward to those talks. Uh, and these are our winners for this year. You will get certificates and prize money and we will have a award session to, to uh, recognize um, your achievements. And next is we will have poster winners, four poster winners. The posters will be judged by its content on the poster and visuals, so don't, fe don't feel obliged to stay there and present. Feel free to network and hang around, and we, that those will be judged by the content. Um, then uh, we have a QR code on your program that you can scan if you want to look at the abstracts that were submitted and the posters that are displayed out there. Okay, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Pat Walters uh, to kick off the symposium. Um, uh, Pat Walters uh, is the chief data officer in, in Relay Therapeutics. I think you probably all know about Pat, so I will not go into the long bio, uh, but I'll give a shout out to Pat's blog post that I'm very much fan of, the practical chem informatics. Go there, it's, it's very resourceful. And with that, Pat Walters. So many of you know me from yelling at people about statistics. Um, I'll do a little bit of that, but I was asked to provide a rousing introduction. So I think this has been a really exciting year for machine learning in drug discovery. We all saw that both the chemistry and biology prizes went to work on machine learning. In particular, the chemistry prize went to David Baker and the team from DeepMind for protein structure prediction. It was very exciting that we saw the AlphaFold 3 paper come out, and then it was incredibly disappointing because there was no code. And none of us can actually do anything interesting with the API that they've provided. However, you know, I'm happy to see that there are a lot of efforts out there now to reproduce AlphaFold. Uh, anybody who's interested in this, I'd highly recommend looking at Charlie Harris's blog post that he updates regularly. And that kind of gets you up to date on all the efforts to reproduce AlphaFold 3, and Charlie is actually trying things out too. You know, I think it's been a bit of a mixed bag in terms of clinical trials for AI-focused drug discovery companies. During the summer, there was this paper that came out from Drug Discovery Today, written by a group at Boston Consulting Group who clearly does not understand our field. And this paper claims that AI-focused drug discovery companies have been more successful in phase one clinical trials Somebody wants to come to me on the break, I'll explain to you the 12 things that are wrong with that paper. And Derek Lowe had a nice blog post where he pointed out that the phase two results, although there are only a few, have been a little disappointing. However, you know, insert your favorite sports metaphor, it's early in the game and I don't know if we can make any conclusions there yet. One of the things that I'm most excited about though 
is data. On Wednesday, I was at an AI and drug discovery symposium at Boston University. There were two panels in a row that came to the conclusion that the biggest thing holding the field back to this date is a lack of high quality large data sets. And you know, I've written extensively about all the problems with MoleculeNet and the therapeutic data commons and the fact that those data sets should never be used for anything. However, there's some really exciting work going on. One of the things I'm most excited about is the Open ADME Consortium. So this is a, an effort that's spearheaded by Jamie Fraser at UCSF, John Kadera at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and some of the folks at Octant Bio. And this effort has two aims. One is to generate large, high-quality ADME data sets and make them publicly available. Second, and I think I'm even more excited about this, is to do structural biology on off-targets. The structural biology community has largely ignored HERG, cytochrome P450s, PXR, other drug metabolizing enzymes. So I think this combination of high quality data and structural information could be incredibly powerful. You know, I'm a big fan of using machine learning together with DNA encoded library data. Unfortunately, until very recently, there was one publicly available data set. There was a carbonic anhydrase data set from the Broad. It was relatively small. It's great that there have been some great papers that have appeared this year. There was a paper from Samaya. There was a paper from Insilico. There was a paper from University of North Carolina. But even better, people are releasing more data sets. There was a great Kaggle competition sponsored by Leash Bio and the Structural Genomics Consortium has an effort called AirCheck to collect all of these data sets and make them available in a consistent format. So I'm hoping you know, with some of these efforts around data, we can push the field forward. A lot of people ask me, where should I go to find good data sets? There's a great effort that's been put together by a group around <coughs> a website called PolarisHub.io. Polaris is collecting data sets making them available, but also providing recommendations and having industry experts evaluate those data sets. Polaris has workflows for data curation, and it has workflows for method comparison. So there's a lot of great resources there for people who are interested in protein ligand interaction. So docking, cold folding, activity prediction. We no longer have to deal with PDB bind. There's a much better, larger data set out there. There's been a group in both industry and academia that's put together this Plinder data set. It's very large. It has rationally defined train and test splits. It's well annotated. So I think there's a lot of exciting data sources. I can't walk away without talking about model comparison because it frustrates me when I open up papers and I still see these tables and people put their method in bold and they don't do any statistics to compare things. I've been complaining about this for a decade. We finally did something about it. So there's a group of us from a range of biotech and pharma companies. We put together a set of guidelines for method comparisons. We also have a set of Jupyter notebooks demonstrating best practices. This paper was submitted to archive yesterday. So hopefully either today or tomorrow it will be available. So we've made a lot of progress, but I still think there's a lot of things we have to figure out. And there's things that we don't do well. And it frustrates me when I see people at NeurIPS, you know, doing yet another diffusion model. Let's work on the real problem. So I've built a machine learning model. I have a new molecule. How do I know whether I can make an, be confident in my prediction? So defining the applicability domain. You know, yes, we've got message passing neural networks. We've got GNNs. But ultimately, we're still using the same molecular representation based on topology that we've been, used for, been using for 40 years. We really haven't figured out how to integrate 3D into our representations. We haven't figured out how to make transferable representations. You know, you see all these papers coming out on you know, various ways of generating molecules.
but nobody has figured out how to determine whether those molecules are synthesizable or whether they're even chemically stable. And then finally, drug discovery is not just optimizing potency. It's not just optimizing ADME. We want to be able to optimize multiple properties, usually dozens, and we still don't have good methods for doing multi-objective optimization. So in case you missed any of the links that I put up to any of these wonderful data sources, if you go to my website, there's a resources link, and that resources link has links to everything that I talked about today. Anyway, that's, that's my time. Thanks.